Hey everyone, Igor and Benji coming at you from the Contractor Evolution Studio. So one of the prevailing principles that circulates the business world is that of hard work. Nothing of importance was ever created or achieved without a tenacious work ethic. You look to sports, politics, business, entertainment, really any other arena, and you'll see no one ever coasts their way to the top. And if they do, they're never there for very long. Having said that, there are a few problems that hard work won't solve. It, like a lot of things in life, provides diminishing returns. Slogging it out for 60, 70, 80 plus hours a week can produce a certain satisfaction in the early days. We've all at some point relished in wearing our busy badge and felt oh so important as a result. And it is a necessary part of becoming who you are as an entrepreneur, but let's be real here. No one can go on like that for very long without serious consequences in the other equally important areas of their life. Family, health, sanity, friendships, and overall well-being. This is why balance, particularly between your business and the rest of your life, is an important habit to build really early. Your life and your career is a seriously long game. It's many quarters, lots of intermissions, maybe even some overtime too, right? And your real success in business is going to come from compound returns over time. We hear this in investing, right? If you want to become a great investor and generate great returns, you'll need to be in it for the long haul. But this concept is just as relevant when it comes to your own skills in business. If you want to be a great leader, a great entrepreneur, you're going to need to stick with it for a while. So if you want to play that long game, you'll need to strike that that elusive day-to-day balance between business and every other aspect of your gigantic life. There's no one-size-fits-all formula and everyone really does need to figure it out for themselves. But today, we're super excited to speak with one entrepreneur who has already, and he's done so at an impressively young age. Yeah, today on the show, we have Graham Bouvier from Bow Group of Companies. Uh, They're a painting and drywalling contractor based in Saskatoon. Now, Graham's first few years as an entrepreneur, like a lot of ours, were really grim, right? He was working nonstop, barely making any money, putting out fires left, right, and center, um, really confronted with with serious burnout. Um, But all this hard work, even five years ago, only resulted in about a million dollars a year in annual revenue. And then... Two years ago, he had a serious breakthrough. So by changing his mindset, his habits, and the structure within his business, he was able to grow his company to over $7 million a year in revenue while taking a staggering 26 weeks off and traveling for a lot of them. So in this episode, he's going to tell us how he does a couple really amazing things. One, how he creates space to think strategically as a leader running the organization of the size that he does. Um, He tells us how leaving on a trip can actually stimulate the growth of your employees because they're forced to figure shit out. And also how he's implemented a really cool yet simple financial tracking system that has allowed him to step away from the day to day. So let's dive into it with Graham Bouvier. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Graham, welcome to the show. We're really excited to have you. What's up, boys? I'm excited to be here. Graham, good to see you. So good. So, Graham... Um, you've got a really cool story. Uh, we've, we've known you for a few years now. Um, and you have come an incredibly long way from year one in business, you know, running around like a chicken with your head cut off, putting out fire after fire, stressed to the max and doing a million dollars a year to last year, closing in at 7 million, 7 million in revenue, um, traveling, enjoying life, super balanced, super controlled. You own Bo Home Group of Companies. You know, you're 27 years old, 80 employees running almost an eight figure business now. Super impressive. We know that it wasn't always this way. So maybe like wind back the clock a little bit and take us through that evolution year over year from when you started till now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it all started with college pro painters, believe it or not. So I was in school to be a doctor. 
And I took a summer class and there was two months. I couldn't really find a good job. So I actually signed up to be a painter with College Pro. Didn't really think much of it. And the franchisee owner really liked me, taught me how to estimate, all that fun stuff. And then the next year, he wanted me to take over his franchise. Heard about all the royalties, stuff like that. So yeah, screw it. I can do it on my own. So that's what I did. Me and my buddy, we started up a painting company. I think that summer we had two, three employees. Didn't really know what the heck we were doing, but it was fun. Made some money. And then the next year after that, I partnered up with another buddy of mine who was more into like the business stuff. I was in school to be like a doctor, like I said, so knew nothing about business. And my buddy really helped me in terms of like, okay, let's grow this thing. Let's actually make it a business. Grew it up to 10, 10, 11 people that next summer. And man, if you can imagine, there's us two in four university classes each trying to run a painting company with like 11 employees, no idea what we're doing, literally running from fire to fire and no idea how to manage cash flow, nothing. It was chaos. So we did about a million dollars that year. And at that point, kind of realized I didn't want to be a doctor anymore. I was making decent money. Didn't want to go into another 12 years of school. So I, I decided to do the painting the full time. And I guess it would have been a year after that, me and that partner split up. He went and worked for his dad, which was always the plan. And then I met my current partner, Jay. Um, so yeah, three million we did in 2017. It was literally three times as stressful. We were just running from fire to fire, um, super chaotic. So that year we joined up with Breakthrough Academy and helped us out so much. So we actually got some business knowledge. Like I said, I was in school to be a doctor, knew nothing about it. So really found out stuff about cash flow planning and marketing and making a sustainable business. So that year would have been 2017, 2018. And we were still working very hard. Like, don't get me wrong. We're still putting in 12, 13 hour days. But at that point, we kind of saw what we were working towards. It wasn't just mindless grinding. So got to a point, it would have been in 2019 where things actually started to pay off. So I was able to take, well, 24 weeks, almost half of the year. I didn't quite make my goal, but 24 weeks of the year I was gone, which is awesome, and, and let our leadership team actually lead. And then 2020 obviously didn't travel as much because of the COVID stuff, but it was still a really good year. So Very cool. That's a very cool. overview. Yeah, it's a very neat story, Graham. One of the things that I've always really appreciated about you, and we've now known each other for, for a number of years, is just this incredible focus and desire you have towards the work-life balance and not just being a business grinder. You talk about you took 24 weeks off last year running a $7 million business at such a young age is so impressive. Even the stuff that you and I have done, uh, it was, is so cool. You know, we've been, we've been fishing in Northern Saskatchewan in a fly and lodge. We've been cat skiing in Colorado. We've built houses in rural Mexico. Even just the stuff you and I have done is cool. Not to mention your travels all over the world. I'm wondering where did this realization come from for you that life isn't just about business, just about working harder? Like were, were you, were you born that way or was there certain things that happened in your life that awoke you to this concept? Yeah. So I, before I go into that, I think there's really two distinctions between entrepreneurs. There's like the lifestyle entrepreneur and then there's the take over the world entrepreneur. So there's guys that always want to be doing the next thing, always getting more businesses, all that stuff. And then there's the other entrepreneurs, which is more of the lifestyle entrepreneur, which builds up a business and then kind of travels and does all that stuff. So I wouldn't say there was one particular moment, but when I was in, I guess it was first year university, me and a couple buddies went to uh, South America for two months and just, well, like I just said before, at this point, we were running a million dollar business and we just went to South America for eight weeks and just pretty much said the business will run itself. And then at that point, I kind of <laughs> got the travel bug and just enjoyed it so much, just experienced so much on that trip. I just needed to keep going. And I mean, the business didn't crash and burn when I was gone for eight weeks as little just trial and error. So I thought, hey, might as well be able to do it the next couple of years. And that's what I did. So, so yeah. good. So, you know, you, you talked to us about this 
progression from year one to two to three and sort of the lessons learned and how your your lifestyle, your workload, your stress load shifted. It, it, it got easier. And I'm wondering if you um, can speak to some of the early wins. What were those like lessons or tools or systems that you implemented in those early years, let's say 2016, 2017, where you started to see a a light at the, at the end of the tunnel, were there um, practical steps you took that you'd share for someone who's maybe listening right now, who's in that spot that you used to be right now? Um, So one of the big things for me was, I guess it would have been in 2018. So me and Jay, Um, my current business partner. And for you guys that have business partners, this is probably one of the the biggest lessons I learned was defining our roles. Because before that, me and him were doing everything. Like we're both calling the customers looking for money. We're both calling customers trying to get work. We're both doing the marketing. We were talking to everybody. And because of it, we're like tripping over our own feet. When we actually defined who was doing what, and held accountabilities for ourselves, everything started to change because we had deliverables. Each of us had deliverables that we were able to actually get done. And there's no more, hey, I thought you were supposed to do this. No, I thought you were supposed to do this. So it was actually at a, a BTA Winter Summit that we kind of were on the brink of, of breaking up. And it sounds like a marriage, but it really is. And we were so close and that was like the one big thing that we we did was just really define the rules and and ever since then it, it's been a lot smoother um i guess another big piece that i'd go into is just actually hiring and i know we're going to get into it later but hiring the right people like not trying to nickel and dime those hires especially the key hires in your leadership team and actually like allowing them to lead too so find really good talent and then let these people actually do their job. Mm. So many times when it was me and Jay, we were, we were micromanaging so much and we were essentially doing their job for them and weren't allowing them to actually fill out that role and be the leader that, they, that we wanted them to be. Because if you think about it, if you're in that role, they're not going to kick you out. You're the business owner. So until you actually step out, they like, okay, controller, you actually be the financial controller I'm going to let you do your thing. Then he's actually able to do it and lead his team. Yeah, very cool. I remember one of the things you and I had previously talked about is this concept of you having to step out as the ultimate leader, as the founder, where uh, that were you exiting for some period of time and literally not being there, whether you're not in the office or you're out on vacation, allows those people to step into their power zone. Tell us a bit more about that concept that that's so important to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so... I will never forget when one of my mentors told me this because it just, I'm sure when I say it, I'll probably hit you guys the same way is he runs a financial advising company and he hired on this new secretary. Literally two weeks into the job, he took, it was like a month long vacation and the girl understandably was like, Oh, how do I get a hold of you if there's any problems? And then he was just like, well, you don't. Like, what do you mean? What if it's a big problem? It's like, oh, you'll figure it out. And if not, I've hired the wrong person. So like, that is literally what he did. And this guy's like the master at delegating. And I kind of adopted that, not as extreme, but I definitely have in the sense where if I'm actually able to travel and these people, these people that we've hired aren't able to get a hold of me, then they're going to figure out a way to solve the problem. I'm not going to have to be there to hold their hand and they're going to learn a lot better too when they're actually going out and figuring it out on their own. I I always say there's two ways to solve a problem. There's like problem-based theory and method-based theory. So problem-based is when they just go in and figure it out on their own. So you have a problem that you want to solve. Say, for example, we want to get more sales. They go in, they figure out how to get more sales. It's not like, okay, we got to, Go on Facebook ads, then we have to start messaging a bunch of people. You got to go cold calling. You don't give them a bunch of the steps. They just figure out how to solve the problem on their own. So you're not there micromanaging. And what a lot of people actually do is the method-based, which they give them a step-by-step guide on how to hit the problem, when really it takes a lot of work on your part, and they might be able to solve the problem on their own, which is a lot better. That's re- That's a really interesting idea, Graham. Um, and I, I think that 
business owners that manage very, very closely, there's, there's this like terrible fear that if they go on a two day camping trip, things are going to completely disassemble while they're away. Mm-hmm. I get where that comes from, but I, I challenge people who think that way because you're actually keeping your people from growing by being there all the time. If they can just rely on a phone call to boss to answer the question, there's growth, there's maturing that doesn't happen because you're constantly hovering, you're constantly available, you're constantly solving problems for them. And so I I don't think like immediate and rapid delegation is always the answer, but I think if you can creep towards that over time, you're going to see your people step up. Yeah. Well, think about it this way too. If you have an issue and they call you and you solve the problem, what are they going to do the next time? They're going to call you again and you're going to solve the problem. So until you actually teach them how to solve the problem or let them figure it out on their own and solve the problem, then they're never going to learn. It's a really and, cool feeling too as an entrepreneur when you when you come back from those weekends or you come back from the the whatever it was. Maybe you, you camped with your friends, you went for a hike, you, uh, you maybe you went for a week and and we're out of the country. Whatever it is, when you when you come back from those events and you kind of see that you know nothing is burnt to the ground. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. There's usually a few things to deal with on your first day home, but it's it's invigorating. It's super exciting to be like, holy smokes, this actually is a functioning entity. It's a re- for me, it was a real moment the first time I did that. Yeah, then it's an actual business. Totally. Yeah. So, so many people, it's not really a business for them. It's just another job. Because if they're there, if they're not there, the business crumbles. And it's not until you can actually leave and still make money that it's an actual business. Yeah. It's interesting. My experience with this is exactly the same, guys. I remember in my first year running a painting company, right? I was, uh, I had the opposite problem. I was delegating way too quickly. I remember turning over literally six employees within a month and a half and the whole business basically crumbled because of it. So I almost had to learn the opposite problem of how to lead effectively with enough direction, enough guidance, all that stuff. But because of how terribly that experience went, I swung the other detrimental way where I was overseeing everything. And for the following two years, everything went through me. And I developed, you know, like you said, Graham, I wasn't a leader. I had people that needed me there all the time. Now they could paint the houses, but I needed to be, be there for all the pivotal stuff. So it wasn't until it was the fourth year, and I remember the exact pivotal event. I went uh, with my family to Greece for a month, and uh, and I was like 21 years old, and I remember coming back from that with a stack of paperwork, the stack of checks, the set of happy customers, and I was like, wow, this really does work, but I needed to swing both ways. I was... I. You know, I had challenges because I didn't train and lead effectively enough. And then I swung too far the other way where I was micromanaging everything. And it took a couple of years to find that mix. But you're totally right. Like th- there, there's a level of detail to which you need to train your people and manage them. But then you do have to let them do their job so they can rise to be the people that they need to be. Yeah. And, and I think people actually think that they need longer. I think people are sometimes in their sixth or their eighth or their 10th year and they're going, well, maybe, maybe they're ready for it now. And I, it's like, it's like, I think you probably uh, could have done that a while ago. So mm-hmm. I, I agree. There's a pendulum that swings back and forth. You do need to find your own spot on it. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about Graham? Tell us a bit about some of your cornerstone practices that you kind of follow now, either daily, weekly, monthly. Like, what are you doing that allows you to stay fresh, think strategically as a leader? Um, what What are those rhythms and rituals for you? Yeah, I think that's one of the big things that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially guys that are in that work hard culture, they forget to actually think strategically. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things I forgot to mention, one of the big things for me was really hopping into personal development. That was the first time I really started to ask, like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Do I actually enjoy paint and drywall? Do I actually enjoy that? And it was the first time I actually started asking myself that question. And I, I got to a point where I was making quite a bit of money and I had all that freedom, but I still wasn't really enjoying what I was doing. And it wasn't until I really focused in on like creating that culture, thinking strategically and making those like big problem decisions that I really started enjoying what I was doing at Bo. And 
that's the thing that a lot of people get into is they are just working hard, working hard. Everything's going on, running from fire to fire. And they never ask themselves if they actually are enjoying what they're doing and think strategically. So what I do right now is, well, every two weeks on Breakthrough Academy, we'll hop on with a coach and then three other similar businesses and just go through goals for the week. And that's been such a huge thing for me, just actually sitting down for not only that two hour coaching session, but also before leading up to it and just thinking about the big picture, thinking about the goals that I have on the table for actually going to hit it. What do we have to do strategically to make sure we hit that? And then reviewing that not only on a biweekly basis, but also on a monthly basis too and quarterly basis. So that, that was a huge thing. And I guess to bring it back a little bit too, like I do it on a, a daily thing as well. So every morning I'll just, there's this really good book called Road to Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham. And in there he talks about thinking time. And that I started implementing that probably a year ago. And the whole concept of it is essentially just asking yourself questions that will get you to the, where you want to go. Asking yourself like really strategic questions like, how can I get to $3 million? How can I make, I don't know, a million dollars in sales this month? And then just sitting there for 15, 20 minutes, no distractions, just you, a pen and a paper, and just write down whatever comes to your mind. There's probably going to be a lot of garbage in there, but there's going to be some good stuff in there too that you can actually use and implement in your company. But until you actually take the time to think about that and ask those questions, I mean, you're never going to get the answers to them. And one thing I want to add before you guys jump into is a lot of people, they don't have that path on where they're going. So they have no direction to get there because they don't know where they're going. It's a really powerful concept, right? When I when I objectively look at it, I'd say 90% of entrepreneurs, business leaders, don't spend nearly enough time thinking about what they want and how they're going to get there as opposed to just doing the thing, especially in contracting because they're so operationally busy. There's so much operation going on. It's a labor-driven business. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very few. And I think a lot of the, uh, the people that I find that, uh, that, that have challenges growing as a leader and actually scaling the size of their business effectively, profitably, um, mm-hmm. in a stable kind of way. Um, what keeps them back is are the the stories in their head of why it can't be done, why it's so difficult, why they need to keep running around from job site to job site, training people, checking on quality, all this kind of stuff. But they don't actually take the time to sit down and chart a strategic path forward. And, and, and I, I love what you say there, Grim, like about those, those, that biweekly rhythm, even just the time in the morning to take calm time away to think. And just for our listeners, I think one of the things would help, can you give us a, like a couple super practical tips? Like how do you carve out that time in the morning? When do you do it? Mm. What do you do with your phone? What do you do with your email in that time? Like, how do you, how do you create that space for yourself? Mm, yeah. Okay. So I bet you 98% of people wake up, look at their phone, see all their emails, and then it's an automatic to-do list. Totally. So I'm not the best at this. I mean, I still struggle with it, but I try not to look at my phone for like the first hour of the day. And then that actually gives you the time to reflect, actually gives you the time to go through a morning routine. And, And that's something I'm really big on too, is actually having a morning routine to like prime yourself and get ready for the day. And I know we'll talk to it later on in the podcast, but just making sure you have a set routine in the morning that is going to make you at your peak performance throughout the day. So whether that's going to the gym, whether that's meditating, whether that's writing out some stuff you're grateful for, whether it's thinking time, there's so many practices to do. And I mean, there's tons of stuff in books, but I think one of the most important thing is just something that really works for you and is authentic for you. For me, for example, I really like meditating, going to the gym, thinking time. Those are my big three things I do. Let's dive into it now. Like I I think, I think the, the practical steps we should, we should discuss. Like one thing I've always found um, really impressive about you, Graham is, is you strike me as someone that's like very abundant. And I know that you have a pretty cool gratitude practice that you, Mm. that you, that works for you. So maybe just like describe what that looks like in your day to day. Yeah. So I do it always in the morning because it gets me in a really good state. Literally, as simple as it sounds, just writing out 10 things you're really grateful for. So it would be like, 
pen I to paper. Up this one. Pen to paper. Like you literally just like put it pen on the paper. scratch pad. Yeah, cool. Write it out. And I know it probably sounds pretty crazy for a lot of contractors. And the first time I heard it too, I was like, what the heck? I'm not going to do that. I got to paint houses, man. Started, what's up? We got to paint houses, man. No time to be go. grateful. Yeah. No, we got to paint, yeah. Yeah. But like the first time I did it, it's probably like the first two weeks. I was like, what the heck? This is stupid. But then once you really like, it's kind of like meditating too. Like for the first two weeks, it's like, what the heck? This isn't working. And then you get like one really good meditation. And it's like, oh my God, I get it. Or you're doing your gratitude list. And then it's like, you really feel it emotionally. It's like, yeah, this is, this is what I actually enjoy doing. I have so much to be grateful for. It doesn't matter about the other problems. Mm -mm. And, And sometimes it takes some time, but literally pen to paper. If you just think about it, it's not the same. When you write stuff down, you think about images. And when you see images, you can emotionally connect to stuff. And when you emotionally connect to it, that's when you actually get those good feelings. You so can, you can probably notice, Graham, the days when you, I'm, you know, and nobody's perfect. I'm sure every once in a while you kind of deviate from that practice. You can notice the difference in headspace, the, the, the frequency that you're vibrating on when you're really in that practice versus when you're out of it. And do you, do you notice that affect the way that you lead your people, you, the way you deal with customers, the way you make decisions, like, Talk about the impact that these kinds of practices have. Oh yeah, I think I think everybody gets in that state where there's just so much going wrong going wrong in their day and just keeps piling up one after the other. And it's because they're in that state because they're just flustered, everything's getting rushed. And until they actually slow down, and whether that's yeah, write out some stuff on a gratitude list, whether it's meditating, going to the gym, you're not going to be able to like recalibrate and actually perform those daily activities. One thing that I just started doing like a couple months ago is when I'm in those bad states, I actually just like stop work altogether. If I'm like, I can't get out of it, I will just cancel my meetings for the day hmm. or block out like an hour two hours, just push my meetings, go to the gym. So I'm back in that state of actually like being able to perform because there's no point of working harder and working in that state. If you're not getting any work done, you're, you're literally hamming a, you're hammering a, a, a chopping board with a dull knife and trying to like do something. And it's just getting duller and duller. Your arm is getting tired and it's such a, it's defeating place to be because no matter how hard you try, the thing that's in front of you is not getting done. The task that you've been assigned is, is taking forever. And so I think, um, I think that's a powerful thing for someone to hear from someone like you that has achieved some success, like hugely. These are the, like, you're the first person to say, no, clear my afternoon. I'm not in a good headspace right now. I need to like get right before I deal with this stuff. Um, and that's a very different approach than, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll sleep in for an extra hour next week. You're like, no, I need to be good now. Um, and that's, yeah. that's, that's something that you've, you've really embraced. And, and I think we can all see it in the way that you manage your company. Yeah, it's, I get it. It's hard for some people to do because they're just starting out. Maybe they don't have the, the systems in place or the people in place. And it doesn't have to be clear the day or clear two hours in your schedule. It could be just like a simple breathing technique where it's just like taking three deep breaths in or, like I said, writing out 10 things you're grateful for. Like that, that doesn't take that long. That's maybe five minutes. And if it gets you into a good headspace, I mean, why not try it? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be a big, long thing. It doesn't have to be clear the whole schedule, clear a couple hours. That's what I've done. I've been fortunate enough to hire some really good people and have a good leadership team in place. But I get it. Some people probably can't do that. So there's techniques that take a couple minutes. It's a process. And this is one of those things where it's baby steps. So if you're not in a place yet where you can, you know, clear the schedule, take a second, go for a walk around the building, take a breather. Um, but oh, you're, you're going to oh. be better off than trying to totally grind your way through it. And that's, that's, I think the, the piece I want people to, uh, to kind of wake up to, um, Actually, uh, before we move on to your next point, Benji, a really good thing too, is just going out and walking outside. That, that's a big thing. That's really helped me too. I'm a huge, I'm a huge walker. When I've, when I have a really big like sales day and I've just got meeting, 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 I will 
leave my phone in my office, just walk for 10 minutes around and come back and sit down. And then I can do another two hours and I'm a way better version of Benji than if I had just like tried to finish the notes and, you know, tried to do some other task. It's like, no, take, take a second, get right. You're going to be better off. So there's, then you get Benji 2.0. You don't want Benji 1.0, 100%. So here's a question for you, Graham. I've always kind of felt that, um, like using you as an example, you travel, you read, you explore, you experience different cultures, you put in an effort to living abroad and a and a big life. And do you feel like like doing that actually makes you a better business person in some ways? Like does that does that have a a feedback to your performance in business that that you notice? Yeah, big time. So I think it all goes back to what's your why. I, I think that's kind of the core thing that every entrepreneur should think about is why are you doing what you're doing? And I will never forget the trip that we went to Mexico um, down in Ensenada. There's there's a bunch of causes I've donated money to and, and all that stuff. But once you actually go down there and see the way these people are living and actually like experience it, it's just like I was talking about with like the gratitude list. You feel it emotionally when you're down there and you see how these people are living. And the same thing with traveling, you experience different places, experience different cultures. You realize that there's things that are bigger than you. It's not just about making money, buying the next car, buying the next house. There's so much more that you're on this planet for, especially when you're like deeply connected to that. Why emotionally, then I, I'm a strong believer that you're going to be a lot better entrepreneur because of it. Because, I mean, chasing after money is only going to get you so far. Yeah. On this theme, one concept that I've always found so interesting here in North America, just observing like work culture, especially in this uh, like macho work hard contracting mm-hmm. space is, is that uh, often people don't, realize leaders don't realize the cost of their grinding when you're out there mm-hmm. working 60 70 hours a week you're mentally in that game what are you missing out on with 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 your family your children uh the travels and the experiences that the world has to offer right there's um there's always a cost right and some people will go through this life uh never experiencing uh the feeling of being in uh, in the, you know, part of an Olympic summer, winter, whatever, uh, the FIFA World Cup, seeing the Coliseum, whatever it means to you, or even really being present for, you know, your children's upbringing, whatever it might be. Um, and Graham, I'm wondering for you, like, where did this curiosity for all these things in the world come from? Yeah, yeah it was literally that trip down to South America when I was first year university. I was pretty lucky too to to have a family that was that was well off, so we were able to go travel and experience different cultures and all that too. So I knew there was a lot out there, but when I was actually able to go down to to Bolivia and kind of see how people were living and realize that everybody doesn't have a, a house to live in or um, have a lot of the privilege that we do in, in Canada and the states that I really realized, like, yeah, there's there's a lot more out there. Mm-hmm. So that was probably the biggest thing for me is just actually going and exploring and just going backpacking and, and doing that. And there's so many people that keep putting that off too. And there's so many different ways to travel. Like when you're younger, going into hostels, being cheap when you're traveling is such a different experience than going when you're 45, 50 years old, staying in fancy hotels and stuff like that. You don't experience the culture the same way. And I'm really big on when you go and travel, like actually go see the cultures. Don't just stay in the all-inclusive resort. Go out, see how the people are actually living in the city and the country because it's such a different experience. Mm-hmm. So good. Totally. You, you know, on your on your comment about not not realizing what's uh, what you're missing, it reminded me of a story uh, like years ago when I was right in the depths of of sort of running my painting business. I'd set these really lofty goals for myself. It was like my second or third year. And I was I was not on trend to hit them. I was going to miss them. I was miserable about it. I was feeling sorry for myself because I was like working so much. And I'd almost built this identity around like this, 
you know, downtrodden entrepreneur that's trying so hard but not getting anywhere. And um, I remember my my dad actually like, he's like, I want to go for a walk with you. And I was like, okay, what's up? Like, I'm busy. And he he was like, you are super unpleasant to be around. You're really, really grumpy. You're short with us when we visit with you. Um, and I just, I just want you to know that like, like this is not a good look for you. That's what he said to me. And Mm -hmm. it like, I had to sit down. I was like, Oh my God, like I'm bringing this version of Benji to my employees. I'm bringing it to my customers. I'm bringing it to myself. Um, I was bringing it to my girlfriend at the time. Like it, it was, a, it was a major moment for me. And I, I actually did like that. That's that not realizing it piece. I needed to have somebody that knew me really well, hold that mirror up to me and, and, and say that. And I think that's why it's good to have, you know, obviously close people in your life, whether it's a partner family members, business partner who can kind of call you on those moments. But when you say, um, you know, when, when you're grinding it out day after day, week after week, uh, you, you're not real. That's, that's the cost. And that's what you, that's what you're not clued into. And I think it's, it's so important to just catch it when you can. And, and that's why, um, that's why those people in your life are important. Totally. And this is why I think, you know, we're talking with Graham about this whole concept of travel. I think this is why travel is so powerful because it's when you get out of this, your current environment mm. that you actually mm-hmm. realize and you can look at it from outside of yourself and see that our North American construct of the economy and of a business is built around growth, right? Capitalism will by definition crumble, by, by definition crumble without growth. And the whole environment is putting you into a situation where you need to be bigger. You need to do more. You need to go faster. And it's only when you actually look around and realize that the whole world is not, not that like way. That. The natural world yeah. is not that way. The natural yeah. world, by definition, would crumble if operated that way. And uh, and that's when you can step out and actually see, wait a second, why am I doing this? And, and is my way of operating sustainable? And again, coming back to Graham, this is this is you know one of the things I find most interesting about you is is you you do realize this even though you're moving at such a fast pace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's two quotes that'll always stick with me, and it really goes good with what you guys are saying is so many people have their self-worth tied to their net worth. Mm, So if they're doing really good, their business is really good. They're pumped. They're on top of the world. They're all happy. But Benji, just like you, you set these lofty goals and so many people have these lofty goals because that's the culture. When you don't hit them, you're miserable, miserable, miserable. And And grand, there's a, there's a huge risk in building an identity around, um, around growth. And so here's what I think I see happen a lot of the times. You have a business owner and they they start their company and a year or two in, they found some success. They're doing well. They may, they're doing better than they thought they were going to when they started. And so there's a feeling of validation and self-esteem that comes from that. And so what happens is they, they double down and then they triple down and then they go, they, they start to say, I, I am my business. And my, like what I've learned is it's like, no, that's one slice of the pie. And there's many slices in the pie that is life. There's your family, mm-hmm. there's your spirituality, there's your physical health, there's your mental and emotional health. There's so much going on and you need all of those things to make it long term. It's sort of like it's like investing in a really hot stock. Like you could put a whole bunch in one and you may have a really good year or two. But sooner or later, you're going to really wish that you had a more diversified portfolio. And I think that exact same theory applies to life. So when I see people that have built their entire identity around their business, their brand, their net worth, whatever, um, I'm the kind of, I'm not like, wow, that guy's so impressive. I'm usually like, I, I like, I hope he's got other interests because this is not going to get you <laughs> all the way to the finish line. That is life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a big thing, too, that I kind of found traveling is these people with literally nothing are happier than a good majority of people in North American culture. Yeah. Like when we went down to Mexico, the living conditions that those people were living in, and I'm not even going to try and paint the picture in here because it's crazy, but they're so happy with what they have. Yeah. And then you go down to the States and the guys got, or Canada, the guy's got a 2,000 square foot house. He's miserable. Mm-hmm. 
And these guys are literally living in like cardboard boxes. It's insane. Totally. I remember one specific visual, just as you say that Graham comes to mind. I remember being on the roof of that house with you as we were framing and looking down and the, they were literally in their cardboard home and a bunch of, I don't know if it's their friends or the neighbors in the area came and there was probably like 15 of them. And one of them was playing a guitar. Uh, a few of the men and women were making a fire just from garbage to heat up some soup, but they were laughing. They were playing music. They were talking. I remember being on that roof with you and you're, you're totally right. It's, it, is, it is so interesting when you kind of take yourself out of our current reality and the perspective you get on things. But guys, I want to move forward and, and just I want to talk about a couple very like practical and important business elements here. Wait, um, Igor, and, before you move on to the next point, can ahead. I bring up my other quote? Go ahead. Second quote. Let's yeah. hear it. Okay. The second quote is so many people, their business gets the best of them and then their family gets the rest of them. So like you're talking about, Benji, yeah. you're spending so much energy in your business, you're grinding away. And then by the time five o'clock rolls around, let's be honest, probably eight o'clock for most entrepreneurs, then you're just drained. And then your family gets the rest of you and you're miserable. It's like, oh, I'm just, I want to be on my phone. I don't want to interact. I was interacting with people all day. So it, it breaks up a lot of marriages and just relationships with people too, because their, their business is literally like their baby. And that's all they're focused on. They don't care about anything else. And I think it relates back to you know, kind of American culture too. So yep. that was one other thing I wanted to add. Awesome. It's, it's, it's a really great quote. And, and, and I will be the first to say, even in the last year or two, I've literally been called out on that word for word. And, uh, and not everyone's perfect. I think if we all look at ourselves, oh, we, yeah, we've absolutely. all been in those times, but it's, it's a very important realization. Yeah, it's, it's a really good practice just to try and be present with whatever you're doing. When you're at work, be present with work. When you're at home, try and be present with home and the people you're with there. So it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a work in progress, but. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to just, I want to talk a bit about some practical elements that, that are needed to actually make this happen. So everything we're talking about is is so fundamental to happy life, but one can't simply just pick up and leave at the same time, right? I think for a lot of a lot of the 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 contractors, entrepreneurs listening, um, I'm sh- you know this all sounds great, but I want to talk a bit about like some of the practical steps that need to be in place to actually make this happen. So, over the last couple of years, um, Graham, let's start with this. What are a couple of the key roles that you've put into place in in your business that have allowed you? to to create this kind of structure and this kind of leadership team for you to be able to live the lifestyle that you live now? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's any one off like the top of my head. Probably the most recent that we had was hiring a controller. But I'll kind of back it up in the sense when we were just starting out with Breakthrough Academy. It would have been 2017, 2018. And I remember like vividly not knowing where anything was in terms of numbers. We weren't tracking any data, nothing. It was literally going to the accountant at the end of the year. And it's like, okay, did we make money? Did we lose money? (laughs) And I know there's probably a lot of people in that state and like, don't feel bad about it. But that is like the biggest thing we fix right away. I remember hopping on like the first one or two calls with James. And like, I just worked like constantly getting all of our numbers together for every job. So we could actually see where we were losing money, where we were making money. Because if you don't have data, if you don't have stuff to actually track, then you're not able to steer the ship. You're not able to steer your business and make proper decisions. So you can hire all these people on board, but how do you know if they're doing good if you aren't tracking the profitability on the jobs they're managing? So that was probably the biggest thing we shifted right away that made a huge difference. And then we started hiring operations managers. So me and Jay were really involved in the operations, especially Jay. And we hired out three operations managers, two to manage, um, actually, sorry, to start, we had two operations managers, one to manage the drywall, one to manage the paint. And we gave them accountabilities, like these are your jobs, this is what we wanna hit for profit margins. And we track that every single day so they're able to see the profit margin that they're making. And 
I mean, it, it makes sense. Like, if you're not doing good on the profit margins, you're not hitting your accountabilities, and, and you got to go. So, well, and and have ha- like having the ability to track that, um, if that allows you to take the take those weekends away, because you can you can still keep mm-hmm. tabs on what's going on back home through a dashboard through technology. Without that, that's where the panic comes from. That's where that's what that's why people are terrified to leave for a few days, is because. They've not built the infrastructure for them to be able to to pay attention to that stuff from a distance. And so I, I believe that probably getting in place, you know, that this these systems you just talked about would have been a huge step in the direction of, of uh, you being able to travel and, and experience life the way you have. Yeah, I remember what a quote from from a professor in a in an accounting class back in the day said like if you can't track it, you can't influence it. Mm. And and so 100% tracking is the first part. I want to talk about the influence part though. When when you did get to a point where you have when you had good data and good numbers coming in, what what became some of your key management practices with these managers? So I'm not talking about with the drywall guys or the painters, but with the with the the leaders and the mm-hmm. managers running them. What did like that weekly or biweekly or whatever cadence you have? What did that look like with them to actually hold them accountable to their goals mm-hmm. and to results? Yeah, so similar to what I was talking about earlier, just setting up a biweekly rhythm. So making sure that you actually spend time with whoever is directly answering to you on a biweekly basis and just be like, okay, what's going on in your division with your accountabilities? Like, where were we at for goals? And just like setting up goals for them for the next two weeks too. And we, we call them GSRs, goal set and reviews. And we really dial in like what they're focused on specifically. Like right so, down to practical numbers? Yeah, right down to practical numbers, like the metrics. So like, okay, we are at, um, say we're at, we want to hit $100,000 for painting revenue this month. And we have two meetings that month. So one right in the middle, be like, okay, how are we doing? What, where are the jobs at? You're going to need more help here. We're going to need more sales. And we're literally tracking every single job, every single number for that monthly goal. And one of the big things too with the GSRs is so many companies don't know who is answering to who. So in the business, they might have a lot of people hired, but it was just like me and Jay, when we were first starting out, we didn't have our roles defined. People didn't know who to talk to. They didn't know if they should talk to me, talk to Jay. And it creates so much, like just a lot of double entry. So one really big thing that we did in our company is just create an org chart and have the direct path of who each person is talking to. And when that happened, we were able to hold people accountable. We were able to build out the metrics for those specific divisions and then actually able to have that biweekly rhythm. Because, yeah, like you said, Igor, if, if you don't have metrics you can track, how are people supposed to make decisions and influence influence on the, their results? Totally. And you, you. It, sorry, and, and Graham, you, you literally have this drawn out, hey, like where everyone oh, in your yeah. company sees it, this organizational structure? Yeah, so we actually just had a meeting, I guess it was two weeks ago, where we spent the whole day and like half of the day was just building out this org chart for the next year, for 2021. So we got six hires, which is a lot that we want to make for next year. But what we did is we all kind of said, okay, who's going to be talking to this person? Who's are they going to answer to? Who's holding them accountable? And we, yeah, we literally built it out a year in advance. Hmm. That's... um. That's unbelievable. And, and like very, very practical advice for anyone listening would be, would be to go through the exercise of, of writing one of those for yourself. Even if it's still a small company and there's only a few employees, put three bubbles on it, start there and you can start to add to it over time. Another thing I think about too, is you've got the structure, but you, you're still going to need some really good quality people to fill that structure. I mean, I just, I don't think that you can build a business on on the backs of B players. Like you do need some really good quality staff to fill that that org chart. So mm-hmm. what what changes did you guys make to the way that you recruited, the way that you interviewed, the way that you onboard hired people in general that has freed up your time, made you feel really comfortable kind of going, you know what? These people got this. Yeah. So before I move on to that point, one thing I forgot to bring up is lots of people, when they're building up these org charts, they'll probably realize that everybody is answering to them. So you have the bookkeeper answering to you. 
the production manager answering to every single right. person. So the org chart isn't really going to look like an org chart. There's going to be you the spider. and everybody else. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. So that's like a really good place to start where you can actually start seeing like, shit, this is why I am so overwhelmed because I am literally the linchpin in my business. I am controlling everything. So if I step out, no wonder the business collapsed because there's no structure. So yeah, it's so important going through those word charts. So the biggest thing we did with hiring, and this wasn't probably till like maybe a year and a half ago, is we really dialed in our values. Mm -hmm. So, so many companies, I feel like, yeah, I know that values are supposed to be important, but they don't really pay much attention to it. They're just words. And they're just, they they're just, just yeah, they'll just chuck a few up on the wall and call those values. Yeah, right? exactly. But nobody actually lives by them. Totally. And that's how you really create the culture. So until you actually define those values and it could be you and your business partner, it can be um, with your staff that you bring in and really define these values. But when you're hiring on people, you got to make sure that the people you bring in are actually going to match these values. What are yours? Oh, what? What are yours? What are ours? Okay. So the first one is protect the fort. So that's the biggest thing is making sure that the people we bring into the company actually fit the culture. Mm. Another one we stole from you guys is be real. What be does authentic. that mean? Yeah. Unpack that. Yeah. Be authentic, be genuine. If you got something on your mind, if you don't enjoy something you're doing, like tell us, let us know. Uh, another one is help our customers build their business through ours. So I feel like that should be one for most sub trades is if you do good work, then the customer is going to be happy with the product and the general contractor is going to get more work from their customer. And then another is every day, get better and better. So constantly learning, constantly be implementing new software. And I think that's one thing we do very well is just making sure that we're always looking for the next best uh, technique, next best like training software, all that stuff. So those are four kind of values that we live by. That's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And then implement these into the interview questions and whatnot too. Like make sure these people, if it's be real, ask them about a situation where maybe they messed up on something and what was the reaction that they had? Were they actually genuine and talk to the person be like, Hey, I messed up. Or did they try and just like sweep it under the rug? And if that's the case, maybe that's not the person you want to hire. Totally. It's, it's, um, and for anyone that has, that has hired someone that is out of alignment with their company values, uh, you know how difficult that can be. So I love that you use that as a centerpiece. It's almost a filter that you're interviewing people for. Do you match up with these? Because if you do, we're going to jive. And if you don't, um, there's going to be troubles ahead. Yeah. I think that a lot of people are very quick to interview for like certain mm, skills, skills. certain abilities, certain natural preferences, experiences. Totally. And there's also tickets and trades too. So it's like, have you, you know, are you certified in these areas? But this other stuff kind of gets forgotten. Totally. And, And all of those I'd put into the bucket of like, can this person technically competently do the job? But if you're just looking at those or the combination of those, you're still missing the other half of the equa- mm. equation, which is, do we jive with this person? Do I jive with this person? Does the company jive with this person? And vice versa, right? Like in the last two organizations that, I, that, that, that I've built and heavily been a part of building for right from scratch is we've spent days and days thinking through what are our core values that govern everything, right? Mm-hmm. And, and once you build them and once you define them, um, only then can you actually look practically at, at new potential hires and be like, is there a fit here, right? So it's really two things, right? Like you have to have taken the time to deeply think through them. And Benji, you're totally right. It's not pulling them off Google, but actually <laughs> yeah. thinking what's important to you. And then from there, uh, properly screening people against those. So it's, uh, it's very yeah. powerful stuff. And I, I think that's a big thing too, especially in construction people start to hire when they have a surplus of work and it's just like, we will take bodies. It does not matter. We just need bodies. You can breathe. Yeah. Come on board. So that's the one big thing too, is you just have like such an influx of people. You're not able to vet properly for the values and then no wonder jobs get screwed up or there's not a good fit and you have to let people go. But yeah, yeah, in construction, I see it all the time and we're that way too. So it, it goes back to why and just like, thinking strategically 
be like, okay, what kind of work do we have coming up? How many people are we going to need? And it's not like the day before you're hiring people, but you actually start hiring people like a month in advance. Yeah. Sounds simple, but. I want to just add one, just because Graham says some real gold there, mm-hmm. uh, which is so important. And the vast, vast majority of contractors I've seen completely underestimate the length of time it takes to make good hires. And, and they're, they're way behind Naples. And on the flip side of it, I don't think I've ever once heard a leader say, wow, I wish we hired this awesome person a little bit later. You'll never hear that. Right. But you almost always hear the opposite. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, for 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 our viewers here, just think about when you've made really good hires, how long that's actually taken you. It's a long process, right? And and I think it's 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 an important nugget to take away is like it takes a while and uh and and you I think for most people you want to be doing it a lot sooner than you currently are. People are blown yeah. away that we 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 coach our members to do like two two hour interviews like well, i just was just at do least a lunch for 30 oh, at least like at minimum that would be for like a, a fairly like boots on the ground role totally. like forget about a manager a decision maker a leader totally igor's igor's very well known for like <laughs> eight month long recruiting funnels just like hey, no, so Actually, slow when i heard that i remember um i think it was in mexico you guys were yeah, yeah, you're in Mexico. We're in Mexico, and you hired on Matt. I'm pretty sure for the marketing role. Mm. And I remember somebody he, like talking about how it took like six months to hire this guy. I was like, oh my god, like six months. And then I was talking to Dan, our business coach, about it, and we were hiring a controller at the time. And I just wanted to get somebody right away. Like, frick, we need to fill this role. Like, let's just get someone. And I remember Stab just saying, like, no, actually, like, take your time with it. And I'm so glad we did. It was, like, a two-month process. We probably oof, interviewed. We had three guys go through the process, probably interviewed each for about 25 hours. And we still got it wrong. We hired the wrong person. Um, he actually quit three days into the job. And the second, the number two guy that we had picked actually ended up being our controller. So glad the first guy quit. But – even with hiring or spending 25 hours interviewing these people, we still got it wrong. And we had all these practices and whatnot in place. So it's pretty hard to find the right person on a 30 minute lunch interview. Right. hundred percent, hundred percent. On that note, I want to dive into that a bit further because it, he, you know, Graham, a lot of people really look up to you, right? You are, you're, you're a super young guy. You're running a big business. You've got 80 employees. Um, and, and it's very easy to look, you know, for it to seem like you've got it all together. But I, I want to talk about a couple more of those kind of examples. Like certainly along this journey, it must have not been smooth. What are like one or two big mistakes or roadblocks you've hit with people where you've just, where you've gotten really smoked in it and it, and it really set you guys back? Hmm. So the biggest thing I, and yeah, there's, there's a couple examples I can go into, but the biggest thing is probably, I'm a nice guy, I keep around people way too long. Mm. So I have a really hard time letting people go. And it might seem like I'm really mean and asshole. I'm not, I'm a nice guy. (laughs) But there's a couple people, especially in in our bookkeeping position, which is a very important position, that I just didn't let go soon enough. And because of it, it cost us quite a bit of money. And... That's probably one of the biggest things is just taking your time when you're hiring somebody. And if there's somebody that doesn't fit culturally, somebody that makes mistakes even two, three times and they don't correct it, let them go. And I know lots of you guys have probably heard that hire slow, fire fast. But like I've spent like hundreds and hundreds of thousands on mistakes. Yeah. And that's probably the ones that have cost me the most money. That's yeah. one of my, I thought like one of my favorite um, messages that I've heard, heard from a mentor is like, don't take a really long time fixing a mistake just because you took a really long time making it. Like you, you do need to have the ability to let go of things quite quickly. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, Graham. It's certainly like you're not unique in that sort of like, oh, I, I'm a nice guy. I like people. These are difficult conversations. I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. But from a business perspective, looking back on it, I mean, it sounds like you're you're pretty clear. Yeah, I, I probably could have pulled the trigger on that months sooner. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think just to circle back to what we were just talking about recently, right? To take it back to like, what are the costs of my grinding? Because that's how you get into the to the extreme hard work, grind it out kind of phases, typically when you're cleaning up for other people, right? What are the costs of not having those conversations, of not making those move, moves quickly on, 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 your, on your personal lifestyle, on, on your family, the way that you show up as a person, right? Um, th- there are definitely real costs to, to having the wrong people in that are, that are yeah. significant. Big time. Um, I think one of the other big lessons I've learned is, especially when I was young, there's a lot of ego when it comes to, to running a business and lots of people don't ask for advice. Instead, they'll just go and try and figure it out on their own and yes. it ends up costing them a lot of money. So when I joined Breakthrough Academy, I was like at the point where it's like, okay, I'm done with business. Like, I don't know if you remember on those calls, Benji, it was like, Frank, if you guys can't help me figure out my cash flow, like I'm done. I remember very well. Season. I take very yeah. good notes. I probably remember more than you think. Yeah, it yeah. was a, it was a I different was like, gram. It was a different gram. Big time. And like to be honest, going into it, I I didn't think you guys could help me. It was literally just like last resort, like let's do it. Let's try it. And that was the big thing is just like actually admitting like I don't have it all figured out and actually going to somebody that had been through that path that understood what we didn't know and actually asked for advice. And I mean, one big thing is just like constantly learning. I think, I don't know if there's any one big point, like one big mistake where it made me realize that, except for, I guess, rock bottom with the cash flow stuff. But like always be asking for help, always be learning. There's always somebody that's doing it better than you are. So just like ingraining that is is a really good piece of advice. I love I it. I love it. It's such a powerful point, right? Like that, that's something that that's very close for me as well. Like I'd, I remember in my early days in business, like I also, I also started a painting company when I was 18 years old and, and that hit me like a freight train after my first few months of probably like those were to this day, probably the most difficult months of my life. And that massive realization that while I was in that deep hole all around me, in this world where people that had gotten through it and it has succeeded to levels, not thousands, but millions of times greater than I was. Mm -hmm. And I could go pound my head against the wall or I could look up and look around and go learn from others that had done it. And we live in such a neat world where the answers are all around us, right? This level of technology and this level of connectedness, learning from whether it's, it's books or videos or podcasts or programs or whatever, the answers are all around you. And there's a more difficult path and there's an easier path. And I'm to this day astonished how many people just pick oh. that more difficult path out of you know, often ego, like you said, Graham, sometimes I don't think people sometimes realize how easily the answers can be found all around, but, um, this modern technology really does, really does make it spectacularly easy. So it's just, it's the awareness of that. Um, Graham, I want to wrap with one final point here, which is something that you said to me a little while ago, uh, that I think would be is really cool. Final nugget for, for our listeners to take away it is you said to me, if you're going to be a high performer, if you're going to be a great leader, uh, you have to treat yourself like a Ferrari. What do you mean by that? Before I jump into that, I just want to say one thing about the piece where there's the ego involved. I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't have the community. Like they don't want to actually pay for mentorship, go in and actually invest in themselves. And they talk to like their peer group, talk to their family when they aren't really qualified to give business advice. Mm. And I see this happen so many times and it's such a big point. Like if you break your ankle, for example, you're not going to go to an engineer to try and fix it. You're going to go to a doctor. Same thing. If you have a business problem, you're not going to go to your mom. That's a nurse and ask for business advice. And this was me back in the day you're going to go to somebody that actually knows business or you should. So I think a lot of people don't really take that or take that for granted and just ask whoever is in their peer group when it's not the right peer group to be asking those questions. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. And, and there's really two elements I think that are important with a peer group, right? It's, it's the, it's the knowledge where someone can 
actually teach you certain things that are important. Like you talked about, you know, the cash flow challenges, which, which we've all struggled with and, and been, you know, like first to the 15th trying to make payroll every single period. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other part of it is also the inspiration, right? Cause I think that that's arguably an even more important part of being surrounded by a high performing group of friends, peers, whatever you want to call it in that space is, is, uh, is people that, that, that inspire you that you can be better. And, and when you look around and, and I think you are this for a lot of people, I'm sure in your group program and someone looks at you and says, wow, this guy's 27 years old and he's doing it. Why have I been at this for, for 25 years running this business and, 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 and I haven't been able to figure this out, but clearly it's possible this guy has, right? So th- th- those are kind of, th- that I think they're, they're two big parts of that peer group, right? It's people you can mm-hmm. learn the skills from and help you navigate your problems. But I think that that inspiration is just as important, if not it, even more. It's more than that too. It's, 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 yeah. it takes the loneliness away. Totally. Right. So it's more than just inspiration because I, there's been so many times that I'm like, there's nobody that gets this. There's nobody that feels what it's like to have one of those epically bad business days, employees quitting, pissed off customers, just like an endless list of fires to put out. There's a feeling of like, yeah, there's nobody to talk to about this because they just, they don't have the context. They don't have the experience. And you get plugged into people that have, and you're like, oh my God, I'm actually, I'm not crazy. Like there's other people that can talk this talk. And I think that's a really comforting thing for people when you talk about peer community. So it's, it's, it's all of those things and more. 100%. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the first time jumping into BTA, I was literally like deer in the headlights because I had Dustin McLean and Darren McLean, who are bosses, mm-hmm. Ryan Lang, and then Kurt and Kevin. All these guys were running very successful businesses. And it's like, oh my goodness, like I shouldn't be with these guys. They're killing it. But that's like you guys were talking about. You're inspired by these people. And then you actually start to, to do the things they're doing and eventually you become like them. So, yeah, yeah it was a big thing. Inspiration so, is like rocket fuel. It's yeah, Ferrari. Powerful. Tell us about Ferraris. Okay. So big thing, entrepreneurs, I honestly think entrepreneurship is one of the hardest jobs out there. I might be a little biased because obviously I am one, but they're we're dealing with so many problems, so many things, so many things on your mind. You got to make sure you are a peak performer. You have the right sleep. You're eating the right things. You're making sure that you're monitoring your energy dips because as an entrepreneur, like I said, you have to be performing very well on like a consistent basis. So the more you can track, I'm very big on tracking stuff. I I just bought this ring. If you guys can see it there, it's called an aura ring. So what it does is it actually tracks your sleep patterns. So I can see if I'm getting enough sleep when I'm not getting enough sleep and I can kind of see the dips in my energy. And another big thing is just like making sure you're putting in like the right fuel if you're a Ferrari, making sure you're putting in the right food in your system, make sure you're actually eating clean, make sure that the food that you're putting in is actually serving you. And I think that's a big problem with entrepreneurs is they're just so busy. Let's go stop at the drive through at McDonald's or In-N-Out Burger or wherever, grab a burger, and then they realize they feel like shit in a couple hours and they aren't able to perform in their business. Mm-hmm. And It's another big thing with just like monitoring your energy dips too. Like I was mentioning, just like going to the gym when you're in a state of just overwhelm and you're in a negative state or writing out a gratitude list or doing some box breathing and just making sure you're monitoring that energy. And one thing that I I got taught by one of my mentors too is you can't be running at 100% all of the time. You have to take days off. You even can take it to the extent taking mornings off. But if you're always at 100%, you're going to get those ruts. And it's notorious in salespeople because they're doing really good. They're feeling awesome. And then whatever, for one week, they just can't close a sale. And it's an energy rut. That's exactly what it is. They're running at 100% before. They don't monitor their energy. And then they just can't close a sale. So super important to take days off take holidays like we were mentioning before and actually like disconnecting from your phone not being on your phone while you're on holidays because that's not really a holiday you're still working or another big thing is if you can't afford a holiday just take a morning off what i do middle of the week wednesday i won't start working until 11 a.m in the morning 
I'll just do whatever if I want to go on, I don't know, Instagram, Facebook, go to the gym, watch Netflix, sleep in, do whatever, but I'll just do nothing so I can recharge that battery. I love it. A high performing entrepreneur doing nothing all morning, okay. sitting on Netflix. And that's it's a important. okay. And that's it's okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, on that bombshell, let's wrap it up. It's been, uh, it's been, it's been an episode of tons of amazing nuggets, uh, both like big picture life thinking, a lot of practical wisdom. I love it. Um, Graham, if people want to reach out to you, if people want to follow you, where, where can we find you? Yeah, just reach out on Facebook. I love to connect, um, especially entrepreneurs. I mean, I was at a stage where I needed to ask for help. So if there's something I said that you really connected with and you think I can help you, by all means, reach out on Facebook. It's, it's just Graham Bouvier, just like it's spelled on here. So be more than happy to talk to you guys. Amazing. And we'll put that down in the show notes. Love it. Uh, Graham, thanks for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and, and it's been some really good learning and takeaways. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That was a blast guys. Looking forward to seeing you soon, man. Talk soon. Take care. Awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, if you enjoyed this show, hit that subscribe button. It's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free.